Hello, I am Kent Hadberg, Director of Choral Activities at the University of Louisville, and I was invited to offer some background information on composer Thomas Morley and give some insight into the performance of his Agnus Day, this year's Allstate Audition Selection. I hope this information will be helpful as you prepare for Allstate Auditions. I first came to know about Thomas Morley when I was introduced to his madrigals, probably dating back to my high school years. Some of the most famous madrigals by Morley include Sing We Enchant It, Now is the Month of Maying, April is in My Mistress' Face, Fire, Fire, My Bonnie Lass, She Smileth, to name a few. Thomas Morley was a student of famed English composer William Byrd. Morley was organist and master of the choristers at Norwich Cathedral from 1583 to 1587, and then he became organist at St. Paul's Cathedral around 1588. St. Paul's, of course, is one of the most famous cathedrals in London. There is evidence that he was hired in 1591 as a spy for the government of Queen Elizabeth I, serving as an informer on the activities of Roman Catholics in England, but that's a story for another time. Thomas Morley could be considered the greatest influence on the development of the English madrigal. His publications of madrigals spawned an entire generation of composers trying their hand at writing madrigals, leading to a glorious 30 or so years of some of the most remarkable music making in the history of English choral music. This period is often referred to as the Elizabethan period, noting the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. By the way, the reign of Elizabeth I who served as Queen of England from 1558 to 1603, parallels almost exactly the lifespan of Thomas Morley. Queen Elizabeth I's 44-year, 128-day reign is certainly long, but our current queen, Queen Elizabeth II, has reigned for over 70 years. Morley's most famous publication of Madrigals was The Triumphs of Oriana, a collection of madrigals by 23 composers, published in 1601. All end with the famous refrain, then sang the shepherds and nymphs of Diana, long live fair Oriana, which was a reference to the Queen of England. His model for this collection was an Italian madrigal collection, Il Triunfo di Dori, in which all of the selections end with Viva la Bella Dori. Morley also wrote what could be called the most important musical treatise in the English language, called A Plain and Easy Introduction to Practical Music, which describes in detail his knowledge of the theoretical basis of music composition at the time. It is in this treatise that we find his Agnus Day. So let's turn our attention now to the music. I think it is valuable to take a look at the score of Agnus Day as it would have appeared to singers in the time of Morley. Here's a copy of that original score. If you look at the lower left-hand side of the sheet, you can see the tenor part. The large capital A is for the first letter of the word on use. As you study this tenor part, you can see a flat sign for a B-flat in the key signature, and then a series of notes, some diamond-shaped, some rectangular, some with stems, and some dotted notes. You also see some notes that are not filled in. These are the faster-moving notes of the piece. Now, if you look to the lower right side of the sheet, you see the bass part. The B-flat in the key signature is noted on both the top space and the bottom line. By the way, the score we are using for the Kentucky Allstate has been transposed down a whole step from the original key. Now, if you look at the upper left side of the sheet, you see the altus or alto part, but it appears to be upside down. On the upper right-hand side of the sheet, you see the contus, or soprano part, which looks to be upside down as well. This is quite intentional, so that if four singers were standing around a table or music stand, they could see and read their own parts. There are two important takeaways from looking at this score. First, each singer could see his or her own score, but not the parts of the other singers. The singers would have to coordinate their timing with each other without being able to see all of the parts. Second, there are no bar lines in the original score. As musical notation evolved, bar lines were used, but when singing music of this time period from a modern score, the music should be sung without regard to what beat you are on. Now, let's look at a, the modern score we are using for the audition process. Obviously, this is a score where you can see all four of the choral parts. Bar lines have been added to help guide the singers. You will note right away that the voice parts enter independently, starting with tenor, then adding in turn the alto, 
bass, and soprano. The rhythm and contour of the vocal lines are similar, and the tenor and soprano lines are exactly like in the beginning. This is a compositional device known as imitation, and Morley uses this device several times throughout the piece. One of the characteristics of vocal music of the late Renaissance is that the lines are interwoven, where individual parts enter independently, often imitatively, and they usually don't end together except at major, major divisions of the text. Each vocal line is conceived melodically and works in counterpoint with the other parts. Each line has its own contour according to the natural stress of the text and the pitches used to set that text. The parts, therefore, rise and fall independently of one another. Another device that composers use is the suspension, when one note of a vocal part seems to hang on while the notes of the other parts change to a new harmony. The held note seems to clash with the new chord, creating a sense of tension, and then that held note is resolved down a step. This happens in the tenor line in measure seven, where the F is held, then moves down to an E. In the next measure, tension is created in the tenor again on an F. In measure 17, at the end of page one, the tenor C is held and then resolved to a B. A little later in the piece, on page three, successive suspensions occur in the alto part in measures 40 and 41. First, the altos hang on to the G in measure 40, then move down to an F. And they hold the F in measure 41, then move down to an E. There are other examples of suspensions in this piece, including right near the end where the sopranos have successive suspensions. They hang on to the G three measures from the end of the piece, then move to an F, which is in turn held until they move to an E. When you sing this piece, you can sing into the suspended notes, adding to the sense of tension and relaxation. You should also pay attention to the word stress of the Latin text. Here is a guide for the stressed and unstressed syllables in the Latin text. It should be noted that each portion of the text tends to move toward the final stressed syllable. For example, Agnus Dei goes to the first syllable of Dei. Qui tolis peccata mundi goes to the first syllable of mundi. And miserere nostri goes to the first syllable of nostri. At the end of these portions of text, there should be a sense of arrival or cadence, even if the voice parts don't all start and stop at the same time. This can help with the direction of each line and the overall shaping of the music. One of the hardest things about singing this piece is figuring out where you will breathe. Many of the lines are far too long to perform in one breath, and care must be taken to make logical choices for breathing. Along with that, singers should take special care to sing the last note of a phrase, just before taking a breath, as musically as possible. The last notes of phrases in Latin texts are almost always unstressed syllables, so they should not receive extra emphasis because of the ensuing breath. Now let's take a closer look at the Agnus Dei text. The Agnus Dei is the fifth item of the ordinary of the Mass, following the Kyrie, Gloria, Credo, and Sanctus. The text translates to Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You can see how Morley split up the parts of the text. He sets Agnus Dei Quitolis through the first 16 to 18 measures. He sets the second part of the text, Peccata Mundi, two times on the next 16 to 18 measures. Then the entire second half of the piece is reserved for Miserere Nostri, or Have Mercy on Us. He sets this part of the text four times to emphasize a plea for mercy. It's noteworthy that he intentionally used paired voices in this part of the text. Also notable is his use of descending vocal lines on the word miserere, where the listener can visualize bowed heads in prayer on the word meaning have mercy. Now I'm going to play through the piece on piano, even though the piano was not invented at the time of the composition. I am using a metronome marking of 70 to the half note. As you follow the music, try to imagine the rise and fall of the lines, even though the piano cannot imitate the voice in this respect. Also listen for the rise in tension in the music and then the relaxation. 
Listen for places where the music seems to come to a resting point, even though not all voices finish a phrase at the same time. As you practice this piece, I would encourage you to try many different ways to rehearse. Here are just a few suggestions, but please use your creativity to come up with other ways to practice. Number one, sing the piece on solfege syllables. I imagine most of you will be doing that. Number two, sing the piece pulsing the solfege syllables on each beat. This helps keep the music moving forward and keeps the tempo uh, lined up. Number three, sing the piece with count singing to keep it moving. One and two and or one e and a, two e and a, singing the notes but using counting on the pitches. Four, sing the piece with a neutral syllable, perhaps do. Number five, sing the piece pulsing beats with a neutral syllable. Number six, you can have one part sing the text while the others sing on a neutral syllable. And you can vary this for different voice parts. Number seven, try starting in various places throughout the piece. This is important because you're going to be asked to sing a solo line and won't start at the beginning, most likely. Number eight, switch parts. For example, sopranos and tenors switch parts. Alto and bass switch parts. Can you sing the other parts? This will also bring out some of the imitation that's in the score. You will be more aware of it. Number nine, sing the piece with staccato notes, shortening every note while maintaining a regular tempo. Number 10, sing the piece at a much faster tempo. And also you can change tempos regularly on this. It, it will be helpful not to get stuck in one tempo. This is just a start of ideas to the number of ways you can rehearse. If you get bored, sing something else or go practice sight reading. Remember finding the syllables fa and la when you're sight reading. F finding those two notes from other notes on the scale will pay off greatly. I wish you the best as you prepare for this year's Allstate Auditions. Good luck.